listening to the non serbian podcast i'm lucy steigerwald and the guest today is justine norton kurtzen who is the editor-in-chief and co-founder of solar punk magazine uh, justine's work has been featured in over a dozen magazines including utopian science fiction magazine ruler lists and jupiter review Justine is editing a forthcoming solar punk anthology for AK Press, and their lunar punk anthology, Bioluminescent, is forthcoming in January 2023. Her nonfiction book, Solar Punk Witchcraft, A Radical Spiritual Praxis, is also forthcoming from Microcosm Publishing in 2024. Uh, welcome, Justine. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, solar punk, I didn't even know the word before... Um, we decided this was an interview to have, but I was looking it up and there's a lot of different avenues to pursue. But first, I would love you to tell me a little about yourself. I mean, I don't want to make you do an open ended bio thing exactly, but sure. I guess I want to ask you about kind of ideology, if, even if that's maybe a dirty word, but I also want to ask you about mm-hmm. sci-fi. So like, can you tell me what sci-fi you love? I mean, especially authors, and just give me some favorites. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot. Um, I mean, I'm glad you didn't ask for just one, because that's sort of like the, the impossible question yeah. to answer. Um, but uh, let's see. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of stuff like Philip K. Dick um, is really great. Um, and then, I mean, Star Trek is like my, my all encompassing life, basically. <laughs> uh, that, do I, mean, I see a Picard sort of... poster in the background? Yeah, Not yeah, so. actually you do. <laughs> okay. There's, and, and there's more too, but you can't really see them. Um, not, not Picard itself, but other Star Trek posters. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I, um, whether it's 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 books or or shows and movies. So um, I mean, that's not necessarily an author in particular, but in terms of sci-fi itself, that's like the bread and butter for me. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a huge fantasy fan as well. Um, everything from like old like white dudes that I probably wouldn't read now, but read when I was like a teenager, <laughs> you know, 30 years ago. There's um, always those. Like, I know, like, you know, Terry Brooks and David Eddings, um, who write sort of like the big epic, epic fantasies. Um, I got, I was really, really into um, Piers Anthony's Xanth universe for a long time. Um, and like in my late teens and twenties, um, which is, it's like a universe, it's a fantasy universe that's all built off of puns. Um, so the, all of the <laughs> books are just like ridiculously full of puns. It it's definitely takes like a particular type of reader. Um, but I thought that they were just fabulous and fascinating. Um, so that's a lot of the stuff I get into. Actually, a lot more than science fiction when it comes to books. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds that way. Yeah. Well, I guess, though, I mean, to answer the direct question a little bit, um, one science fiction writer that I'm really into at the moment is um, Kim Stanley Robinson. He's sort of like uh, a, a, a big kind of name, I suppose, in um, in solar punk, even though he doesn't he doesn't like the term himself. But um, and then two sort of like forerunners of like solar punk and climate fiction, like Octavia Butler and Ursula Mm. K. Le Guin. I mean, like, especially Ursula K. Le Guin, because she's, you know, very ideologically kind of towards the anarchist bent. But yeah. I guess I need to pick her up. Yeah, Yeah, she's um, she's great. Sometimes I have a problem with like, which avenue to go down because Star Trek, I can start saying, well, gosh, everyone says Star Trek is very, utopian and all that and you know solar yeah, punk is sure. supposed to be kind of utopian too but <laughs> i guess i want to ask what are your politics ideology and if there's any journey there or if you were born and declared yourself <laughs> <laughs> right revolutionary from the womb. <laughs> oh, 
I guess hardly, but uh, no, I mean, I was, I was raised in, in kind of a typical white Western U S Protestant family. My, and my parents very right wing and evangelical. My, I mean, my, my father more so than my mother, but, but both of them definitely conservative and evangelical Christian. So that was sort of the environment that I, I grew up in. My dad, uh, towards the end of his life, which was only a few years ago, was very much a Trumper and into the whole MAGA thing. So I sort of came from that. I never, I mean, I I had, even before I really understood what words like ideology or theory or anything like that meant, I, like, I knew I had differences with the way my parents saw the world. I, I never really kind of bought into the um, the religion thing, even though at times I did, but like generally I was always like either skeptical or just like would have rather been out smoking weed with my friends <laughs> than sitting in church, you know, um, you know, agnostic to atheist basically. So I, you know, I was, I guess I was never conservative or right wing, but I was not, you know, I wasn't revolutionary from the womb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what are um, you now exactly? Yeah. So, I mean, over time, I've sort of progressed into a more radical, politically politically active person. I would, I mean, it's hard. I'm, I guess I'm mumbling because it's hard to, I, I don't like pinning myself down. Uh-huh. But I will. Um, I'll try. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm def- I definitely am an anarchist. I would, I, I, if people ask, I generally say that I'm, I'm an anarchist. Um, I'm, I also agree with a lot of things that I read and hear people say who call themselves socialists. I, I definitely am, would never consider myself an, like an authoritarian socialist or a democratic centralist or any of those kinds of things. And, and probably not a Marxist necessarily. So probably more like an anarcho-socialist or left libertarian or, or, you know, any of those kinds of labels would prob- probably work. There might be a, a word out there or a term that, that fits better, but that generally is sort of where I sit. I mean, that's a pretty good... Now, we've had classical liberals, Marxists, um, and some yeah. other non, definitely non-anarchist people on this podcast, but yes. your self-description definitely sounds like you fit with kind of our, our deal. Well, I guess it's time to get to solar punk. Um, Great. The magazine, but also first, like, mm-hmm. tell tell the good people what is solar punk, <laughs> the magazine or the, the the elevator pitch, I should say, something like. Sure. The yeah, blurb, I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Solar Punk magazine itself is a magazine that publishes fiction, poetry, art, and nonfiction that is utopian in nature, and geared towards stories that are hopeful and more optimistic and and like decidedly not dystopian right they're they're not all necessarily like you know stories that exist in uh, futures that are you know perfect where nothing ever goes wrong or you know rarely rarely if ever but they're you know definitely societies in these stories that have progressed a lot farther than we have and and, and a particular emphasis on solutions uh, to the climate crisis uh, is sort of like the core. And it goes beyond that too, into uh, all kinds of social justice issues, racial justice and gender justice. And, um, you know, people who are oppressed by capitalism being at sort of the front of the pack and leading the way forward and all, uh, all of those kinds of things. But for solar pump, climate change is, is, a, is a very central sort of, of issue and how communities come together to, to solve climate change in small ways and on sort of the, the larger scale. So, I mean, the genre itself really spans quite a large breadth and it, it looks different really depending on like when in time the story is being told, right? I mean, if it's like a something that is, they're generally all in the future, right? Because um, it's science fiction. Right. Um, but if it's like near future, you know, five, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, then things probably kind of look a lot more like they do now. So, you know, everything from like the revolutionary period where like 
the world is changing and, and becoming more like the utopia to stories that take place in, in, you know, worlds that are closer to ideal, you know, than ours are. So already you're sort of straddling a lot of different types of, you know, fiction, poetry, and but then nonfiction, mm-hmm. but you're also talking about the real world and obviously about solutions to very real problems. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of like a lot to tackle for one sort of one little <laughs> word, I guess. It is a lot. And for whatever reason, that's just sort of generally how solar punk has always been. I mean, it, it, it started as just art, really, and people talking about that art on like Tumblr groups and, you know, back in like the early 2000s. And then, you know, more recently in the past couple years, I'd say it's a term that is actually like being adopted by people, you know, environmentalists and anarchists generally in that sort of intersection to really like describe themselves now and what they're trying to do in the world, right? The sort of the work, political community building work that they're doing um, in the here and now. So um, it definitely is straddles a weird kind of line like that. And you seem to as well. I mean, I imagine there might be people who are more partial to the the reality of it or more partial to just reading the good, you know, fictional stories about it. Like, oh, yes, certainly. I mean, I know editors. I mean, I won't I I won't say names, but um, editors of some magazines who, um, you know, very much prefer stories that aren't like in your face political right Mm -hmm. um and even if they are solar punk you know but like so more probably in that in that case kind of more towards the utopian side you know like give me a story about character development in a utopian city or whatever um and then there are other magazines where they um they very much welcome overtly politically oriented stories, including our magazine. And there's another one um, that I will, I will mention called Optopia that uh, very much welcomes politically oriented stories. Yeah. So when I was trying to research solar punk, one of the things I spotted was pretty recent uh, slate magazine article. That was, it was like, how, why can't we move past cyberpunk? Mm-hmm. And I've seen solar punk described as a post cyberpunk type thing. Yeah. And then I listened to another interview you did from, I'd say last fall. And the fellow you were talking to was, was very kind of, he was, he was very over dystopias. And so <laughs> whether, what about dystopias is cyberpunk, the sort of, you know, tropey, like, you know, we all know. Um, yeah. <laughs> like what about that is, 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 you know, negative for us. If, if, if anything, like what, what do we need a utopia for strictly in fiction even? Sure. Um, well, strictly in fiction, in terms of fiction and that sort of that world, I think w- dystopia has sort of been, and I think, uh, in the, in the kind of storytelling fiction world beyond just books themselves, Star Trek, again, is is an an example that sort of bucks the trend. But aside from that, dystopia has sort of been the backdrop of pretty much all science fiction, at least all popular science fiction for decades. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, since at least like the 70s and Star Wars and all of that. And again, and again, like Star Trek, there's a, you know, a thing, a book or a, a, sh- a movie here or there that sort of breaks through that. But taken as a whole, it's a lot of dystopia and, and certainly dystopia as like a reality in the real world goes back even further, you know, here in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. But also things have gotten, a, you know, a lot worse and more overtly dystopian, you know, in the last 20, 30, 40 years here in the U.S. as well. And so all of that combined, especially with like the risk, the recession, big, huge recession that hit in 2008 and um, just, I think, sort of the the way thing, a lot of things in general have just been become neg- negative for like focus on on negative and things from a negative perspective 
there's just sort of uh, somewhat at least of like a collective desire for stories that are more hopeful. And that's sort of the root of it. And it doesn't necessarily, we, we like to differentiate between like hope and radical hope. It's not like optimistic hope that is like just naive and just like, you know, wants all the problems to magically disappear and everything to be fine. And, you know, history is forgotten about and all of that. But it's very much like a hope that's rooted in the experience, you know, lived experience of the the present time and the struggles that uh, that people and different groups of people have to go through under capitalism and and through the climate crisis and all of that stuff. And the sort of the the hope that comes out of navigating that and organizing against it and trying to, to like build a better world in that environment. And so I think that's where articles like the Slate article and other things really start, have, have sort of picked up and sort of noticed that like a lot of both readers and writers saying that we need more hopeful stories and particularly stories that actually like focus on solutions, right? So, and then that's where it's, it is solar punk is a lot of times looked at as like a post cyberpunk thing. Cause a lot of the cyberpunk and, and dystopian stories out there, they don't really get at solutions, right? Like the dystopia exists, the bad evil corporate government exists and there's a, a ragtag group of cool people that are fighting them. And a lot of times they don't even win the fight, right? Like they might win like a battle at the end or something mm-hmm. really cool happens at the end. They, they blow up and end up the enemy's main ship or whatever, <laughs> but, it, but there's no indication that things in society actually change, right? That, that systems actually change. Uh, and so solar punk is an attempt to sort of take that storytelling space and focus on stories that do have solutions, whether they're in a, a world or a time that is already nice and utopian and progressed or in a, in a more sort of near future place where there's still a lot of struggle going on. It's a focus on the solutions and the community building and the the sort of hope that that comes out of their struggle to build a better world. I mean, I like that, and I feel like I need more of that. I'm I'm a I'm a definitely a dystopia gal. I was a little old mm-hmm. for the the YA avalanche of post Hunger Games dystopias. Right. The only ones I actually ever read was the Hunger Games, and I think they're mm-hmm. flawed, but actually have some very cool, vaguely subversive messages in them. Sure. But I'm, you know, like, I'm the idiot still watching The Handmaid's Tale after, you know, post row even, because I think, right. to me, those are my horror stories. Mm-hmm. Like, I kind sure. of, I, that's how I scare myself, not with, you know, whatever, yeah. like, the newest version of Jeffrey Dahmer on film or something. It's, that's how yeah, I scare myself. Yeah, stuff that's all too real. <laughs> <laughs> but it also, I mean, I would argue that a lot of those have a sprinkle of optimism, and if only because mm-hmm. a human has not been crushed. Yeah. 1984 is the only, I'm trying to remember Brave New World. 1984 is maybe the only one where there's nothing, you know, sure. I mean, that, the whole point <laughs> is that there's right. nothing left and you get then. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, I mean, I, I love dystopian stories too, without a doubt. And this is actually something that our, our editorial team got into, I wouldn't say a debate at all, I guess a discussion about um, kind of early on in a, on an online chat forum that we have. One of our, our poetry editors in particular, Darusha Wayne, is, is, is super into cyberpunk. And so, you know, we were sort of talking about the whole like dystopia versus utopia thing and cyberpunk versus solar punk. And, and Darusha was pretty quick to bring up that exactly that like it's it's not really correct to pit cyberpunk and solar punk against each other at least in terms of like that optimism because even though cyberpunk stories exist in dystopian worlds it it is all about like that hope and optimism of that ragtag group of, of of kids or people who are trying to take down you know the big corporate political enemy that bad, bad person. 
there's not necessarily a distinction between the, the, the genres or even like dystopia versus utopian stories when it comes to the, the idea of, of hope. Um, I, I, I definitely think the distinction more lies in, well, in this, the solution aspect, right? The focus on solutions in solar punk as opposed to just focusing on tearing down the, e- right. the, the bad, right? And then also, at least, at least at first, it may maybe has it's. I mean, there's there are definitely people who take it beyond this now, but at first and for a while with solar punk fiction, there was the idea that in its relation to cyberpunk, that it's like cyberpunk is the dy- dystopia and brings down the dystopia, and then solar punk picks up at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what happens after that? So things might not necessarily be great and utopian in a solar punk story because the, you know, the sort of apocalypse just happened. Right. And in some of them Uh, and you're building towards the utopia. But then again, others, if they're if they're further out in time, become more more utopian, less and less about the striving and struggling and the building and more about like, well, what could a what, what could a cool, perfect or near perfect society look like? more of the sort of dreaming aspirational. I know that obviously Star Trek is beloved by many and I've seen debates, you know, how utopian it is in its different forms, how utopian it ever was. Um, Mm -hmm. I know some people aren't fans of Picard, for example, or um, I guess discovery um, because the Federation turns out to be sort of more flawed. There's the um, uh, section 31, which is the sort of intelligence services just right. it's not the utopia we were promised arguably i don't know if yeah I'm, i mean there's all does that say that there's always going to be an underbelly and even in a utopian story even in fiction can we actually get to utopia i guess <laughs> yeah i mean I, I don't think that there has to be an underbelly i mean particularly in fiction right i mean that's sort of the or well, one of the cool things about fiction, at least, is that and science fiction and fantasy in particular, is that, you know, we can just sort of imagine whatever we want, the extent to which a a reader believes it or not, or or finds it believable is, you know, is whatever. I mean, I guess, I guess my association with utopia is a lack of conflict in a story, in part because my first year seminar in college was called Mm -hmm. utopias and dystopias and they Mm -hmm. made us read utopia and i had a particularly dull translation i suspect and was was incomprehensible and looking backward by edward bellamy which Mm is awful for um (laughs) (laughs) yeah both as a book and as certainly as a political statement my gosh right and that's my i mean those are my associations, except for Star Trek sometimes. And then obviously that's a more positive one because those that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and with, with Star Trek, with the, the next generation and certainly the original series as well, you do have more of just kind of the straight up utopian storytelling and universe, right? Like everything's pretty glossy and shiny. Um, and, and there's certainly conflict that happens in the stories, right? But it happens with with external players, right? People that come from outside the utopian society, and and, and then there's like con- different conflicts between them. Then it, pretty early on, though, with the next show, Deep Space Nine, it starts getting like they start. That's where Section Thirty One is first introduced, and so you know, and that was in the nineties, nineteen nineties. So it's. it's Star Trek pretty early on sort of brought in that kind of seedy underbelly aspect. Uh, and you're like, you're, and, and yeah, like you pointed out, a lot of people nowadays don't really like the new shows because they've leaned kind of more heavily into that. Um, I, I like it personally. I mean, I'm a fan of all of the new shows and they are, they are darker. And I, I, I think it's really interesting that they've sort of leaned more into the dystopia while, uh, the sort of science fiction literature world is is kind of like reaching towards a less dystopian. Okay, um, that is interesting. Thing. And, and, and maybe and maybe that is the way it always is. Like you know, things happen in literature first, and then stories get turned into shows and movies and such. And so it like filters down that way, maybe or up. But I think in solar punk, there's room for for 
all that kind of all of the above. And again, because it sort of like starts at least in most people's minds, I think like solar punk starts right after the apocalypse, right? Like mm-hmm. right after the, all the evil, the climate change has been like solved technically in that the big bad has been taken down and we're not, we're not contributing to climate change anymore, but you still have to rebuild society to look like something. Right. And so, especially in those early future years, right. There's, plenty of room for conflict in those stories, even while they're hopeful and looking towards utopia, right? Like plenty of room for disagreements over how the future is going to be built. And even for those disagreements to, to get violent in ways, right? I'm just thinking of like storytelling and the type of like conflicts that like keep readers reading. Right. But then even in the more like further down the road, utopian stories, you know, there I guess there, you know, there were all, there will always be, I think, conflicts, disagreements in communities, right? Even if we get to like one of the most possibly ideal places that our society could reach, like there will still be family arguments and disagreements and, you know, teenagers will still hate their parents and, uh, you know, people will still go to community meetings and have vehement disagreements over the way the way things should go and and if 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 an ideal society doesn't still have those things i think then we should really start looking at whether it's actually a utopia (laughs) right or whether it's really a dystopia with a very rigidly structured and enforced veneer of utopia and happiness on top right as like a shell which again is a big old trope, which I'm a sucker for often. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. The assumption that I mean, the, the you hit upon it exactly. I think the lack of conflict that's actually kind of the big sign that um, the inability to have conflict that the utopia is secretly right. a dystopia. That's actually yeah, a good yeah. way to differentiate. Yeah, though I do think it's like it's a really challenge, interesting challenge. The idea of like writing a good story that doesn't have any like real discernible conflict absolutely it's I'm a not even tall sure order, i think yeah i don't even not even <laughs> sure what i what it would look like i mean i think at least recently the closest thing i've read that maybe comes to it would be and i don't know if you've heard of it or not but psalm for the wild built which is it's a it's a book that came out last summer that, that like takes place on a different planet and like a sort of a world where like robots centuries ago gained consciousness and left humans and the the world has been divided into two and half of it is wild and the robots live over and the completely wild nat- nature oh. overgrown half and the humans live on the other half where they have like human society and that wild book, robots <laughs> yeah it's a really it's you should you really should read it i highly recommend it and that story not that there's no conflict, but all the conflict is like internal and philosophical, but it's just, it's, it's so well done and it's like super cozy. And <laughs> the, the, the writer does a really good job of just like, it's a really good book, but, but there is still that sort of internal, like person versus person conflict in terms of like literary conflict. Right. Mm-hmm. So moving a little more towards again, being overly political. Cause that's what we do on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess part of the soul poking at solar punk a little bit more um, is the aesthetic of it. Well, one of the people here at non Serbian was like, Oh, it's like you live in uh, like a studio Ghibli movie. Um, but <laughs> right. I also yeah. relate it to, I mean, I don't want to immediately be like, well, what about tra- the, you know, the, like the, the sort of increase of trad wife shit on the internet, you know, this, this sort of toxic version of environmentalism and things like that. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I guess, well, how important is the aesthetic sort of what's already maybe the stereotype of, of the the presentation of it? I think the aesthetic is important to an extent because the I mean the the sort of pretty shiny is what attracts a lot of people to the genre originally and then they get exposed to the political ideas mm-hmm. and they might not come and get exposed to the political ideas 
if they don't first get attracted by the pretty shiny picture, not to at all like demean artists and the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. no, no. <laughs> so in that sense, I think it, it definitely plays a role in the genre and it's, it's a, and in the political aspect of the genre that I wouldn't dismiss out of hand, but also within solar punk, there has certainly been a lot of debate among, among people who write, write solar punk and, and think about it and call themselves solar punks about just about this exact thing right like you know is are the, are the big huge metallic sleek cool vertical garden skyscraper buildings like is that sustainable is it you know where's where's the mining happening and who's doing it and like all the questions that we totally should be asking on the other hand it's like it's science fiction um right. <laughs> but um, but because solar punk is and has always been overtly political, I think it, it is kind of like incumbent upon us to engage in, in those questions and not just dismiss it as, oh, it's science fiction, especially as the genre just sort of evolves. And and again, people, you know, nowadays sort of taking on the label of solar punk as like a political identity here in the contemporary present time. So yeah, so I mean, so we have, we just kind of have to look at those questions. But on the other side of it that you touched on too, it's it's like we have to be careful that while pulling back to some extent from from like the shiny, sparkly, uh, you know, sanitized future, that we don't slide too far back into what I would pretty easily be thought of as eco or labeled eco-fascism right. close to that and very related, just like pri like primitivism. Right. Right. Of course. And, and right. And so, and because there's a lot of people out there who look at sort of like green brutalism and the, the sort of primitivist aesthetic and also call that solar punk or, or, or like, you know, yeah, the, we, we, the, the pretty shiny is not realistic, but this is, you know, like, you know, rugged rv caravan living and it's like that's great but like if that's really what the whole world looks like and how society is structured then like what happens to people who can't live that way what happens to people who need electricity to survive because like their medications can't get made without electricity or factories or like right so like finding solar punk i think very much is embroiled in a debate and a conversation about like how all of these things fit together and will justify each other and, and, and work and provide a really cool kind of utopian vision that doesn't has doesn't and hasn't have devolved into that sort of place where even if unintentionally it, it turns into like mass genocide, you know? I mean, as far as I can tell with primitivists, they've never asked, <laughs> I mean, the question of how, how somebody, you know, disabled might stay alive. I think the answer is they won't. Whoops. Yeah, exactly. I mean, aside from the fact that like, I mean, it, it might be romantic and all, but like, even, even if I sit back and think about it and like, oh, that, how romantic, like primitive village life, you know, I go outside in the cold, rainy Oregon weather for a half an hour and I'm like, you know, get me inside my insulated heated house, please. So, so, you know, I mean, as romantic as it might be like that, you know, that type of living is just really rough. <laughs> and so personally, if, if there's a way that we can figure out how to not harm the planet, but also not completely get rid of like the quality of life that we've developed completely. I, I mean, I think certainly we're going to have to like scale back and give up some things to make it work. I don't want to, I don't want to have to build my own. <laughs> log cabin right or whatever you know <laughs> i mean part of the appeal of of solar punk to me is that it doesn't you know it's not ludditism or primitivism and mm -hmm. and like maybe a rational more moderate so to speak version of of futurism being totally like not just Elon Musk will save us all, but just like the attitude that one, maybe one magical technology will come down and, and fix it. Um, yeah. 
Like and, you could, and, it's a moderate solution, perhaps solar punk, you know, it's the sane centrist sure. view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it, there's, I think a lot of times a danger in this, in the stories that like, you know, it, 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 it sort of paints a picture where, you know, if, if we find the right technology, then like nothing else has to change. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and, and there's been, a, there's a been, a, there's a lot of talk about that around like ideas of carbon capture, for example, mm-hmm. like it'd be great if we could have big, huge, you know, carbon captured facilities or whatever it looks like. Right. But this just sucks all the carbon out of the air, but then absent any other changes in the world or in society, all that's going to do is just encourage more oil and coal extraction and mining and right like i could see a world where that actually like creates like hyper industrialism right like even to a greater extent than we already have it because it's like well fuck it right we can just you know pollute and and put fossil fuels into the atmosphere as much as we want because we could just pull it right out of the air and you know, use the carbon to make soda fizzy or whatever, you know, whatever they're going to do with it. Make concrete to pave over more of the planet or whatever. Not to diss on pavement because it's <laughs> it's awesome. But <laughs> um, Another tempting tangent, but now I want to ask, is it, you know, what about, I guess, either you or solar punk, uh, can, could, could solar punk ever have nuclear power out of curiosity? Or do you? Oh, <laughs> you're going to make everybody hate me. Um, yeah. No, I'm I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's a, it's, that's a really, I would say controversial topic in solar (laughs) punk circles. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people who will say yes, Mm -hmm. that they think it's that nuclear power obviously is solar punk because, um, you know, barring really specific circumstances, it you know it doesn't put any fossil fuels into the atmosphere and it's it's essentially clean of course right there and then but you you do have to figure out like how to store the waste because we can't get rid of it and 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 hopefully you know that waste doesn't leak and like all of those things like there are other problems environmentally that can happen but in terms of fossil fuels and 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 climate change in particular um, and just the general pollution caused by fossil fuels, regardless of climate change itself, right? Air quality, water quality. Mm-hmm. These folks would argue that that nuclear power is an obvious solution, right? It doesn't have any of those negative side effects that fossil fuel does. And barring like a leak or a meltdown or someone bombing the plant or whatever, you're not going to have any issues. But it's it's also like a lot more complicated than that. I generally am not on that side of of the equation. Um, I would love I would love for nuclear power to somehow work out, but I don't think we're like in a place now where it's a good option. I don't think we should be expanding it. And I would I, I think most many 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 if not most people who consider themselves solar punks would agree that it's not the right solution at the moment. You know, if they found out, if they found a way to recycle the waste or deradiate the the waste or, you know, a variety of things, then it could, then it could be a different ball game, so to speak. But perhaps in a, in a more <laughs> utopian, like more sort of secure society where you don't have as many risks that someone's going to bomb your nuclear plant. I don't know. I'm trying to, I mean. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that really is one of the big risks. I mean, I think melt meltdowns themselves, like don't really ever happen. I mean, it did a trend, you know, like Chernobyl, but like, that's really the only example anyone can point to. So, I mean, in terms of just like day to day operations, I, you know, I think it's safe to say that nuclear plants are, are pretty safe, but it's again, again, it's like what happens with the, the waste that leaves the nuclear plant after it's been used. And, you know, we're such a, again, a war, yeah, we're such a war torn world that like, you know, those things are, are massive nuclear bombs just like sitting near cities waiting to be exploited, you know? Yeah. That's the part that gets me, even though I might be a little more positive about it, but I'm very not positive about nuclear weapons, obviously. So there's some concerns there. 
Sure. I guess we kind of delved into it, but in what, like, how far solar punk could be co opted by, say, right wing sort of. Um, like, I like to point out that people kind of forget that both in the in the book and in the television series, The Handmaid's Tale, part of the supposed motivation for the creation of the horrible theocracy Gilead was environmental stuff. Like there's an, there's an fertility reducing plague, but they talk about all this other stuff. And um, mm-hmm. I was rewatching the first season a little bit and the turncoat woman, Serena says, Oh, we had a 78% reduction in carbon. You know, now that we've created Gilead, I was like, Oh man, why don't right wingers ever try to use that as a straw man against environmentalists? I mean, that, yeah, they don't know what they're missing there. Yeah. I mean, and that's basically what eco-fascism does, right? Is mm-hmm. sort of try to, it's, it's fascism that uses environmental concerns that are, are very present on the left to try and sort of, you know, it's like a, it's like an entry, a point of entry, right? Um, mm-hmm. That, that fascists use to try and pull people from the left into, into fascist ideology. So, yeah, so that, I mean, that's what I think one of the great things about the way that solar punk has sort of developed up to this point is that it's, it's positioned itself to, to be obviously not immune to that kind of like infiltration or co-optation, but at least well positioned to resist it. Mm-hmm. One, because there's, I mean, there's always been a focus and I, I, I mentioned it earlier, but a focus on stories with protagonists that are from groups that are, are in the stories, maybe were oppressed under the current capitalist system, right? So most of the protagonists are, are queer or they're women or they're people of color um, or any, any of the other variety of um, sort of demographics that get shit on by the capitalist system and used as sort of weapons against each other by capitalists. Well, yeah. So, so, I mean, that's one thing that is good in, in terms of just like the way that stories are being told, it, you know, not, not that it's not possible, but it's, it's harder for white supremacy as like a thing that is trying to be spread, right. Mm-hmm. To, to like leak into a story that is being told, not only from the perspective of a person of color or a queer person or a Jewish person or, or whoever it may be. But is also written written by by people from those um, sort of oppressed demographics, and, and you know, there's there's are certainly white people and white men out there writing solar punk and straight people and all of that, and great. But a lot of the people who are engaging in in writing solar punk uh, and publishing solar punk are are people of color and people from the global south. Like at Solar Punk Magazine, for sure, the vast, vast majority of authors we publish are some combination of people of color or queer or from the global south or just from or outside the U.S. in general. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that is a in, in that sense, it would it'll be harder for that co-optation to happen. But again, that, that I mean, that doesn't make it immune and it's certainly something, you know, I mean, like in any political movement, it's something that we all, you know, we always have to be vigilant about just being a, a, aware and watching for, you know, the signs of that kind of infiltration and, and co-optation. Because it will happen, you know, right? Like, I mean, even um, like we were talking before about the, the sort of green, brutalist, primitive aesthetic sort of leaking in and, and people proposing that as... As is that as part of the solar punk aesthetic, well, I mean, or a lack. I mean, I did. I'm not familiar specifically with green brutalist as a term, though. I can obviously. Oh try sure, to yeah, but it suggests an actual building to me still, which to me it does. Exists. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of like like post apocalyptic, right? So like the the buildings are like shot out rusty bombed oh, out like yeah. that kind of thing but then okay. they're they're overgrown with lush green plants so it's like it's 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 they're really pretty and beautiful and appealing looking images on the one hand but the uh, the underlayer is is like an, a post apocalyptic world where a lot of people are probably dead and suffering right <laughs>
I guess you made your case th- th- about solar punk, but it, it, is it explicitly anti-statist specifically? Um, which is a, which is a sort of the same question, but a little bit different, I think, because yeah, no, it's a good question though. I wouldn't, I would not say that it is. Okay. A lot of people, I think, disagree with me. Um, I mean, there are there are a lot of people, and and I think particularly other anarchists who are really into solar punk who are are like very very much believe that solar punk has to be anti-statist and i'm like i'm more of like i would really love for it to be but i try to not like i try to not put a really hard wall up against like how we envision a better future if some if at least in terms of like the science fiction story aspect of the solar punk genre right um because it's much bigger than just the fiction stories but you know it's i don't in that and in that sort of avenue of solar punk the a hard wall bothers me just because i mean science fiction is all about just trying to dream up amazing fantastic sometimes things that aren't necessarily ever going to happen in Mm -hmm. in a real future um, and so I don't want to limit it necessarily, um, you know, so I, th- I feel like if somebody can come up with a, a solar punk future where there is a state involved, you know, but everybody is as happy and you still like check all the boxes. Cool. I mean, it, it would, I think, justifiably maybe not be overly believable for some people (laughs) just because you know just because of just the sort of inherent role that a state plays and it's it's general you know it's inherent function right i mean like if everything is perfect and hunky-dory and then you would imagine also that like class divisions have fallen apart and other things have happened societies evolved to the point where the state is sort of useless because Right, but right. I mean, its whole purpose is defending wealth. It and withered power, away, basically. if not yeah. dramatically abolished, perhaps. Right, and and so in that sense, I think the the anarchists and maybe others too who who do think that solar punk has to be anarchist or non statist, you know, maybe they are right as at, at least in terms of like the farther future stories that take place in, in the more utopian kind of, of world. But if you're talking about a solar punk story that just takes place like 20 or 30 years from now, like we might not have gotten to that place yet. Right. So certainly there would be aspects of the state in the stories. That doesn't mean though that like the state needs to be proposed as a story or uh, as like a solution. Right. And, and I actually do th- think I hope at least there was at some point. Now I'm going to have to double check. Um, but I believe that one of the guidelines, maybe maybe that was Black Cat Magazine. One of the guidelines, at some and one iteration of the guidelines, at least if it's not still there, said that we wouldn't accept stories where the state is proposed as a solution to climate change. Um, I hope it still says that. I don't know why it would have been taken out. That's kind of... <sighs> I like love that and think that's silly simultaneously. I think if we're talking about the realm yeah, of fiction, but <laughs> totally. Well, yeah, again, no, because like, yeah, you're you're like cutting people's imagination in half, right? Like again, <laughs> if if someone can come up with a really cool story, then like you know, if nothing else, it gives us something to talk about and think about, right? And like, yeah, yeah, pick it pick it apart, and you know, how believable is it? Could that actually work? You know, it's a it's a starting point for a good conversation, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who is afraid of climate catastrophe, but also afraid of any potential state solutions, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I have. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I so go many different I, concerns. <laughs> yeah, and I I battle with myself over the whole thing, and maybe that's why I I I consider myself an anarcho socialist, so that I'm so that I feel like I'm like straddling the two, I guess, mm-hmm. but. Because, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, the state is horrible and it's used and its whole purpose is, is you know, just not good. But then, like, I also just wonder, and I know there's probably people who have answered the question really well, you, you know, but like, you know, what happens if, 
you know, all of a sudden there's just no structure, uh, you know, like the, the, the governmental social structures dissipate and, and like, you know, we get, you know, hordes of angry white dudes running around killing people. I mean, that's a fair concern. Absolutely. (laughs) And, you know, and again, and then, you know, not that like, you know, even if we had the state, like chances are a lot of the cops will be part of those hordes, you know? And so like, is the state really going to help? Like all of those things, but it's just like, I, I don't know, you know, like I constantly struggle with like, is there a role for the state? Is there not like, maybe the state could be used to like check white supremacists and only that, or like, you know, or like, or only to, only to put capitalists in prison or like, but like, that's just oh, also that road, not can't go down realistic. That road. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, give, give people power and they'll just abuse it, you know? So um, so why give people power over other people in, at all? Like, I mean, there's the summary um, for it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so I, you know, so I understand the, the tension in solar punk where that comes in. Cause like, I feel that tension in my own just sort of perspective and ideology pretty regularly. As um, market leaning anarchists here at non-Servium, that's the terrible truth. We got to ask about market dynamics and solar punk. Is there any room for any kind of market? <laughs> I mean, I would say no. Okay. But I don't, you know, I don't speak for the genre. <laughs> well, you are today, I think. <laughs> I, well, sure. Um, I mean, there's there's a whole world of, of market anarchists, anarcho-capitalist folks out there who are super into solar Oh, don't punk. put us with the end caps. We're trying to, we oh, don't like them. <laughs> is there a different, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, there I, is, no, oh I my apologize. gosh. <laughs> okay, then I will definitely uh, not lump you in the same in the same group. And, and I'm going to go read up on, on what the difference is. There are definitely, like there's a, uh, and I, I don't know which of those two groups they would fall into now because I need to figure out what the difference is. But there, uh, there's a festival happening in October down in Texas called Solar Punk Summit. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, I don't know how they would de- describe themsel- themselves, but they're, they're definitely anarchists who are not opposed to market solutions. Okay. Even market solutions sounds more suit and tie than sort of yeah, right. we want it to. Well, and a lot of them are. A lot of them are like are, are like business tech, like NFT, cryptocurrency type business people who are sort of coming at solar punk from that kind of tech and and business, you know, like how can business be part of the solution kind of of perspective. Yeah. Which obviously you're a little dubious about, but I guess, but again, since solar punk isn't light, it isn't primitivism, Mm -hmm. where can things like an intranet or, you know, maybe non-essential to survival technologies, like where can they be, if anywhere, in solar punk? I mean, I think they have to be integral. I mean, I mean, I think solar punk without the without the sort of high tech aspect or the technological solution aspect uh is not super solar punk i mean i I think that's a i think that's a very integral component of solar punk personally i mean i think that those things could happen or develop without markets also maybe i don't know enough about like market philosophies and economics as sort of like divorced from like overt capitalism um, because, you know, and, 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 and that, that might be something where I need more, more education for sure. I have to give a shout out for center for a stateless society. Oh yeah. I'm familiar with them. Markets, not capitalism is the, is sort of their motto and, and name of one of yeah. the books compilations they put out. So there's a whole school of thought there that's trying to hmm. differentiate yeah. itself. Yeah, I mean, I guess where my philosophical issue, well, I, I don't know if it would just be philosophical, it's a very practical issue too, would come in is is just where it, where it comes to um, people making money off of other people's labor. Like whether you whether you want to label that as exploitation or not, that's that's sort of where I start to have an issue with the idea of, and may, may, and maybe that's not necessary for 
a sort of market economics divorced from from other aspects of capitalism. Um, but I hate the idea that like my boss could just be sitting somewhere at home or on a beach, like making money off of every hour of labor I do just because they were born into wealth and were able to like start a company or whatever. But, and I, and obviously that's not how all businesses run and function. Right. I mean, like I own Android press, the, the, the publishing company that publishes solar punk magazine and we publish books too. And I make like no money, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Like literally like everything that the company comes in goes back out in author payments and royalties. And maybe one day I'll, I'll make some money. Um, but, but I'm, you know, I'm my, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the only employee. So if there were going to be other employees, then, then we, we'd have to rethink things. Yeah. And I how, mean, there's, you know, and how the money is redistributed is distributed amongst the people who contribute to the, to the company and all of that stuff. But that's a problem we hope to have at non servium someday that we don't have yet either. But yeah, yeah I mean, right. these questions do sort of appear, especially in mm-hmm. the pre utopia era. Yeah. For sure. Um, a question we like to ask also, which obviously has a market association, but any answer is acceptable, is how would I buy a cappuccino in the solar punk utopia? Or would I be able to? I mean, any again, like... That's a good question. I mean, I think... Um, again, I, I, I think... Well, no, you know, I, I mean... In a lot of ways, I think the answer would be that you couldn't buy okay. one. Why? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't be able to get one. But okay. Well, because I mean, I guess if if we're sort of thinking about solar punk, um, like I said before, as and like and like the the way it exists in relationship to dystopian stories, right? S- where like solar punk is like where the apocalypse ends or the dystopia ends. And whatever comes next begins, right? So, depending on where you are and like the spectrum of the of or timeline of the future, you know, right after the apocalypse, depending on what the apocalypse looks like, right? Or 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 right, you know, right after the collapse of the state, what you know, what however you want to frame it, you know, will you know what will money look like? You know, will you be able to? You know, will money be used at all? You know, will there even be a coffee shop? In, that functions for you to get a cappuccino right yeah the answer very well maybe no is there a replicator like a... <laughs> yeah but right then i think the yeah the the further we get into the future certainly i'll take a replicator i mean i'm not picky <laughs> yeah right um then you can certainly get a cappuccino whether you would buy it or not whether society is using money or not i don't i mean in, in my sort of vision of a utopia you wouldn't need to buy it you could just sure. get it um <laughs> and even if there was a coffee shop with people working in it right you wouldn't you still you just wouldn't have to pay like mm-hmm. um don't ask me about the details of it i haven't worked it all out <laughs> i mean now i'm trying to think if the original thing was how would i get a cappuccino so maybe i have sent you on a maybe different... buy or get but yeah but 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 really too i mean there is you know I mean, if we're not limiting the imagination and thinking of it in terms of science fiction, it's not, you know, it's not impossible that climate change would get solved and society would evolve into more utopian like, you know, fairly stateless thing without, you know, some apocalyptic event that like destroys things. And That'd be nice. <laughs> it, it would, right? That'd I mean, like, I, I certainly would, would prefer that. So maybe it's not fair to just assume that like apocalypse happens and everything is horrible and then we go from there, right? I mean, maybe we do, there is a point where we're going from here to there, but like that point is, doesn't necessarily have to be just, you know, the end of everything as we know it. Um, So in that case, maybe you, maybe you will be able to buy, maybe it's totally fair to say you'll be able to buy a cappuccino in a solar pump society at least early solar punk society (laughs) that's fair yeah before we figure out how to all be rich and that really there's i mean that's the function of a replicator in in a in like a a society with like a a, the right 
ideological framework at least uh, right where it's not just going to be something that's exploited but like you have replicators then everybody gets to be wealthy theoretically mm-hmm. right because as long as the replicators you know, you know as long as you're not like having to mine the earth in order to provide materials to the replicator right like 3d printers use sand right like how you know that that's not necessarily super sustainable like eventually are we going to run out of sand i don't know maybe not but you know, if, if, <laughs> there's a lot of sand out there. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But if it's like a replicator that is just like pulling random molecules and atoms out of the atmosphere and rearranging them into like physical objects, then you know, then theoretically, you've got like infinite, well, or at least near infinite resources, right? In which case, everybody could be wealthy. I mean, I guess I assume that's how they're supposed to function. I don't know. I'd have to check on it. Is, yeah, I mean, it, is, it, is in, it is in Star, <laughs> it's Star Trek, at least, right? I like, at least in, in, in that sort of future world, that's how it functions. You know, you can pretty much make anything with them. And, it, and it, that's what it does. It like pulls molecules out of the air. And then it also recycles stuff, right? Like right. It'll, it'll throw out a plate of whatever food you want to eat. And if you only eat half of it, you put the whole plate and all the silverware back in the replicator and it zaps it back into its disparate atoms and molecules that then go back into the atmosphere or whatever. Now I'm wondering if anyone has written sort of a, a nanobot gray goo style end result that starts with a replicator, something, Hmm. something menacing there. I don't know. Yeah. Again, I like to think of, I like to keep my pessimism in fiction and less so in the real world. I guess I want to a little bit more like poke at the differences between futurism and solar punk. Sure. I would think they're maybe not necessarily at odds, but future punk is betting all of it on a magic technology, I guess. I mean, just that there's like, there's, there's so much technology involved in there and I can see it being... You can make a shallow version of solar punk that really doesn't say anything. You can make a, you know, just add a couple of potted plants to the to the factory. I don't know, like it's it's solar punk, guys. Like, mm-hmm. what do I do to bring about the glorious solar punk future? Like, what what does every individual person do to to make that sort of thing come closer to reality? That's a hard question, partly because. So- Solar punk is really concerned with like community and collective solutions and, right. and like the like the the systemic changes that need to happen. But also, I mean, I'm not I don't want to like just dodge the question because to 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 make those systemic changes happen, individual people have to, to do things. But I think I mean I I do think that that is one really key thing is that people need to be engaging in political education Mm -hmm. because I, I really do believe, I mean, I consider myself a revolutionary also like I don't want a violent revolution. And, and even if, even if, even if the revolution or a revolution was going to involve some kind of, you know, like violence or wars and fighting between groups or whatever, you still have to move people along uh, in order to get them to a place where they're ready to to engage in that kind of activity, right? Well, you either have to to, to people either have to move along through political education, or things just have to get so horrible that they're like forced into action by desperation. Right. Ideally, you know, we could move forward without it coming to that point. And to do that, right, if I mean, if we if we want to create big systemic changes in any way, but especially without big violent, you know, like global revolutions and and conflicts and stuff like that, um, then it it has to be a lot of a lot of of what we're doing, at least needs to be about political education and in engaging not not just our, our with ourselves and sitting at home with a book, but being out and doing community building and political education work as part of community building, right? So that like we're, we're building groups and communities of people who, who all are like certainly have, have differences and disagreements in the way that they see things, but are all sort of have a similar vision in mind of, of what we're trying, you know, the future that we're trying to build. 
I was looking up on YouTube to see what I could find and uh, stuff about Earth ships and a few other sort of oh, technological uh -huh. ideas. And, yeah. or again, sort of a picture of like, you know, an architect. Oh, my building has trees in it. So that's solar punk, right? How do you get beyond sort of one person's showpiece, one rich, rich guy's yeah. experiment in a really cool house and sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think maybe that's the doozy, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, I mean, then that's important because those, you know, that's not, that can't be what a solar punk future looks like, right? Like, right. we just, we all can't have an Earth ship on a sprawling ranch. Like, it'd be nice, it'd be wonderful, but we just can't for, for a wide variety of reasons. But... I mean, one way that at Solar Punk Magazine we're working to sort of step back from that is by pulling focus away from those sort of like picturesque scenes, particularly where they involve buildings, cities, and and even technology, right? I mean, even though we're we're definitely pro technology, um, and 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 cities are great too, right? We're not trying to negate those things, mm -hmm. um, but like all all of the cover art that we've had for this whole first year, for example, and we might do it next year too, all focuses on people rather than on, on cityscapes or on technology. Um, and there, you know, there might be a building or buildings and, and, and technology also in the cover, depending on the cover, you know, I think one of, at least one of them is just like a person big, mm -hmm. Some of them have technologies and buildings, but they're they're all it's they're all it's all a focus on on people and and like the the relationships between people uh, and and the stories that develop out of those relationships, and so there's that. But but then I also think too that sort of on the flip side, it is it's important to develop other n sort of new, I guess maybe, but solar punk images that that aren't that like neat and shiny like one of one of the art pieces that we published i think it might have been in our first issue is of it's a, it's a city but it's from the perspective of a person sitting on like an apartment window balcony five six seven stories up right they're like fairly large apartment buildings um you know and like people there's like laundry hanging and um, you know, there's, there's businesses and the guy, the, well, I don't want to say guy, the, cause you can't see them, but the, the person who is, who we're seeing through their eyes is they're, they're like smoking a cigarette and like, <laughs> right. It's not, it's not just all like perfect and flashy. It's, it's a little bit more kind of like gritty. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, so I think images like that are important to, for, to, to develop and and get out there labeled as solar punk, right? Like this is a person's vision of a utopian society, but it's not an, a massively idealized vision of it, right? Like there's, there's lots of pretty things and, and plants and everything, but also people, you know, aren't living one person per square mile or whatever, right? Like people are still kind of like, packed into a city and living in these in big apartment buildings and things like that, that, that sort of like make it more realistic and sort of tell other, the other side of, of this, the story, I guess. I mean, making a more accessible utopia, an imperfect utopia, I think would make mm -hmm. it more, easier to reach a little bit. And that's pro that is a key thing too. That you know, when when we talk about utopia, I think it's important to always and maybe I probably haven't done that en enough or if at all here, but to really emphasize the idea that like we've we've really kind of pulled back from the idea of utopia as a perfect place, right? Where mm -hmm. like nothing ever needs to be improved. That's that's sort of the root meaning of the word, and so there, have, you know, there have been attempts at other versions of the word also, just that sort of pull back from the idea of perfection. And some of them work, some of them don't. One of them is actually just utopia, but it's spelled with a silent e, and it's like, come on, that's that's not going to work um, <laughs> if you're really trying to like coin a new term. But but there are there there are some that are useful and and that should be used more than we do, right? I mean, like instead of just trying to change the definition of utopia and back it off from perfection, 
Maybe a new term is needed. And so then the one in particular, and I mentioned a magazine named Optopia that is a solar punk kind of utopian magazine. And they're called U- uh, Optopia. And then I'm pretty sure that they coined the term, but it's a term that is like utopia, but it's it's a society that is as as like ideal as it could possibly be given current circumstances, right? Okay. Yeah. So that that leaves a lot of room for lots of not perfect, not ideal things, right? But like, given what we've got to work with in the current time and place, the society is the best that it could be in that time and place, right? And that is, a, that's a much more realistic way to look at it, right? That like, we, we could, we can do the best that we can to make things as great as we can. But we also recognize that like, that kind of perfection is impossible right like this it's we're not talking about deities and like omnipotence or you know like that kind of like all that's mythological right and Mm -hmm. if we want to keep it rooted in the real world even though it's science fiction if we want to keep it rooted in reality then ideas like optopia are probably more useful than than utopia talking about this makes me think of kind of anarchism being accused of being a utopian way of thinking and as a way to dismiss it obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely think anarchy is an anarchism is utopian or if not utopian, it's, it's an, it's a very idealistic philosophy, even if it's not utopian. And I, and I, I I could definitely see where a lot of anarchists would balk at the idea that it, the anarchism is, is utopian, but certainly, you know, we're trying anarchists want to build a better world. Mm -hmm. I guess, I'm asking you, and I'm not going to ask you some of the things we thought about asking you, like explain the you know, per, like the agricultural system you'll have, and sort of just like endlessly. Oh, yeah, because I don't know. I mean, <laughs> there are interesting ideas being bandied about and stuff, but I am not going to do that. But again, solar punk versus anarchism, you get people saying, "Well, how are we going to fix every single thing?" You know, sort of explain how it's sure. going to be perfect before we can move at all in that direction. And I guess that's right. kind of a hard task for solar punk and Mm. anarchism both. Yo. Yeah. And it's, it gets so tiring. Like it's, and and I, I I imagine that socialists probably get it to some extent too, although they probably have like a more ready answer in a lot of ways, maybe not though, but, but yeah, but it's, I mean, it's just not realistic at all to expect that. And that just any random person is going to be able to outline even like you know, like even if there was a program <laughs> out there, like the you know the future, the program mm-hmm. for the future or whatever, like any one person is not going to be able to explain all of those details to you. I mean, that that person might be out there, but generally, right? I mean, just like asking some random person that says that they're an anarchist to like explain an intricate detail, how the economic system is going to work and how the, how agriculture is going to work. Like the the average person is just not going to have those answers. It doesn't, but that doesn't, you know, it's, it's used to as a way to be dismissive, but people shouldn't let it be dismissive, (laughs) I guess, because it's a, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a pretty like elementary and immature conversation tactic or debate tactic yeah. or whatever. I mean, it's meant to shut down the dialogue and, and it's just not, again, it's not realistic, right? Like just because I can't explain those things to you with eloquence, you know, that, that doesn't mean that anarchy just gets is as a philosophy should just be thrown out. Right. It just means that I might not be, a very eloquent person, or maybe I'm just not super smart or like any variety of things, right. That like, I'm just not the right person to ask. And I don't mean here in this dialogue we're having, I just mean people generally. Or just maybe it's not any one person's job to remake society in every way. Cause that's how you get weird authoritarianism anyway. Oh, totally. Well, yeah. And it just assumes too, that like, anarchy is that like narrow as a as a ideology and philosophy that like what one person sits here and describes is going to be representative of every other anarchist out there and every other type of anarchism or subdivision of anarchism right like the the answer is not going to be the same every time you ask it so right. it's just a little bit too much generalizing to begin with Again, 
I feel like y'all asked for this solar punks for for making it sort of fiction and not fiction trying to this ambitious project I guess and I feel like we're both sort of <laughs> dancing between fiction and nonfiction um yeah yeah and sure. it's sort of an unreasonable ask of you because you you know what you do is you something that's very literary even though I know there's some nonfiction snuck in there I guess mm -hmm. what are you like how are you helping? Like we talked about making images of, of utopia more accessible, less far off and shiny and stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. like what is, like what is fiction and sci-fi doing to, to, to bring about very non-fictional solutions to stuff? Sure. I mean, I think that a, a lot of the, I mean, for one, a lot of the, I, you know, the ideas that seep into popular culture in general start with fiction stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether they're short, short stories or novels or plays or TV shows or, or whatever, right? I mean, all, all of these ideas, they don't, I mean, that's not necessarily where they start, but I guess, I guess it's the perspective that, uh, I mean, entertainment in general is an entry point for a lot of people, right? Pretty much anyone out there enjoys and likes some kind of entertainment. Certainly there may be exceptions, <laughs> um, you know, but mo mo most people have something that they do, whether it's like a show that they like to watch or they like to watch movies or, or they read comic books or they listen to audio books or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Most people have some kind of like storytelling entertainment in their life. And so it's, uh, you know, and I, we sort of talked about this when we talked about like the, the pretty shiny aesthetic of, of solar punk, but you know, whether, whether we're talking about that aesthetic or not, or just solar punk in general, the, the sort of fictional entertainment, the science fictional aspect of it is a way to get people thinking about the bigger, more important questions. And I think, you know, something science fiction has always functioned that way in a, in a very, to a significant extent from uh like you know races or groups of spe species of people on faraway planets you know and all of the like stuff going on in space being metaphor for social problems here on earth and things going on with humans i mean that's just sort of always always been a thing right and so solar punks very specifically is is trying to use that sort of storytelling entertainment venue to sh shift more people in our culture towards the idea of solving, well, social problems in general, but the climate crisis in, in particular, right? Um, it, it really is in a lot of ways about moving those, I mean, not, not, and it's not necessarily people who think that climate change is fake or anything like that, but <laughs> It's really, it's really about like moving people to action, right? It's, it's not about like changing their minds and convincing them climate change is important, right? But like telling stories that ins inspire people because they, you know, they see that like, hey, you know, they get inspired by what a character does, you know, and they want to go do something, right? And they want to, they want to go do something to save the world or whatever, right? And obviously no, no, no one individual person is going to do anything to save the world but hopefully these stories that we're telling through the solar punk genre um, are doing just that inspiring people to some little you know go to get involved in whatever they need to get involved in to help make it a reality some organization or not <laughs> can you write a mm -hmm. story with that in mind and still have a story without it being sort of agenda driven i mean those are obviously not necessarily at odds, but again, looking backward is a horrible book <laughs> and it has yeah. horrible politics. You're not really, I guess you're not serving a cause if you're not writing a good story, if you're writing a parable, someone's going to read it as a parable and maybe, maybe it'll work, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could work, but I mean, you'll, I mean, you'll, you might lose a lot of readers, but yeah, but I mean, I, yeah, I do. I mean, I think, I think that is kind of an important aspect of it is like mm -hmm. the fact that the solar punk, at least the literature is not about 
it's not about necessarily beating people over the head with the politics, but the politics are still important, right? It's, it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I guess with all of the, everything with solar punk, it's like, it's walking a line of, uh, and and a balance of like, not too much, but not too little also, right? I mean, now, as soon as I said that, I started thinking about nuclear fiction, which I'm a big aficionado of, and how frequently unsubtle it is, yet effective. I mean, something like War Games, like, becomes a parable practically at the end. I mean, it's not... (laughs) Or even, like, um, On the Beach, things like that. I mean, it's not subtle. <laughs> right. Sure. And, and, you know, maybe and there, it doesn't have to be. I think sure, I need things and, to be subtle, but then I think how much I love those things. And maybe that's not yeah, true. Right. Well, and, and there's, there are, are works out there that are considered solar punk that, that aren't subtle at all mm-hmm. either. Um, I mean, Ministry of the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson is a good example. It's, I mean, that, that book is all about how society goes from like, you know, runaway capitalist dumpster fire to something that looks more like a utopia and, and sort of a lot of the nitty gritty that goes into that from like the concept of like billionaires and, uh, and like all of that stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's very much in your face, mm-hmm. but it is, but it's, the story is told really well and the story structure too. Um, it's, it's told from numerous different perspectives and, and it takes a lot of different, like, you know, sometimes it's people interacting in dialogue uh, and, and doing things plot wise. And other times you'll have whole chapters that are just like a person reading a climate report that came out of some organization in India in 2045 or something like that. Right. But, and, but, but it all like comes together and works with the story and, and, yeah. and tells this really cool story, but it's, but it's all, it's very in your face. Um, and it's definitely considered a solar punk book. So I guess they, I mean, they run the gamut. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if in your face, you can pull it off. It happens. Um, mm-hmm. If somebody wants to know, not know about solar punk as like instruction manual, but like to find a story or anything mm-hmm. like that, like what, what, should, like what can they start with? Like, I, all right, I've listened to solar punk. What do I? What's going to tell me about solar punk? Either in a fictional way, is there a te- is there a perfect text, a seminal, foundational text, or a? <laughs> uh, platonic um, ideal i guess I sure I'm yeah so yeah so there's a few books uh short story anthologies that is that are basically kind of like you know when people learn about solar punk and and start to want to read the stories these are this is pretty much where everybody starts out and goes to one is the very first solar punk uh short story anthology that was produced in english um, which is called Sun Vault Stories of Solar Punk and Eco Speculation, and that the stories in that are really great and kind of classically solar punk. Uh, and that that's edited by Phoebe Wagner. And then Serena Ulabari from World Weaver Press put out two, well, a few solar punk anthologies. Two in particular um, that are a series called Glass and Gardens. One is solar punk stories that are set in the summer and one is solar punk stories that are set in the winter. And so like what, you know, what sort of the challenges are in the communities and what the sort of technology and solutions are that are climate change and climate solutions focused and and that kind of stuff. Um, Also from the same press, World Weaver Press, there's a uh, anthology called Multi Species Cities that is specifically a solar punk anthology, but that sort of like pulls the focus back off of humans a little bit. Sure, yeah, and 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 places more emphasis on on other living creatures and beings that that share the ecosystems with us, uh, and and you know share cities with us uh, mm-hmm. for for that matter. So those are all like really, really, really solid starting places for anyone who wants to to read solar punk stories. I carefully wrote those down. 
<laughs> yeah, and like I said, they're they're all short story anthologies. So you know, it's not like you, you're not you're not picking up a book, and then if if you don't like it, you've you've wasted a bunch of time. You know, it'll take you you know a half hour, forty five minutes at the most to read any one story. A lot, and a lot of them even less than that. Well, now that you've touted Solar Punk, do you want to say what you and or Solar Punk Magazine? What are your upcoming projects slash current projects? Oh, sure. Oh, wow. There's a lot. Well, so Solar Punk Magazine specifically, we're, we just put out our fifth issue, uh, which is themed uh, Solar Punk at Work theme. Um, so mm-hmm. it's sort of looking at what labor looks like and what labor relations might look like, what the economy might look like, jobs, etc. in Solar Punk futures. And then our sixth and last issue of the year comes out uh, in November. uh, And that one will be themed Lunar Punk, which is like Solar Punk, but sort of like not a flip side of it, but like uh, it still has has like focus on climate change and solutions and sort of hopeful stories, but it has sort of more of like a Gothic aesthetic and takes on a bit more of like more like spiritual components and a lot of times too is more like focused on individuals and like change introspectively as opposed okay. to like the community outward collective aspect. Um, so it's, it's just like a sub, it's a very much a subgenre of solar punk, but just with some, some different emphases. And then uh, probably in December, we will s- launch our Kickstarter for, to fund our second year, which is basically because basically the, the, I mean, the way we work it is people, if they get a subscription, it's just good for the one year. We don't, we don't keep charging people year after year, um, you know, cause people forget, Oh, I had a subscription to this thing. And then all of a sudden you've got like a $30 charge on your bank account and you're like, what the hell? So every year people have to actively renew their subscription mm-hmm. And I don't know if it will be a Kickstarter or if we'll use a different platform. Kickstarter's maybe wearing itself out. Maybe not, but but so that will happen um, in December. People will be able to start getting subscriptions to the to the second year of issues. So that's exciting. And then Android Press, our our, our publisher, also has a bunch of stuff happening. There's a, a climate a climate fiction conference um, that is that we're organizing that is happening on October first. Um, so coming up really just in a couple weeks, uh, and that'll be a bunch of panels and workshops on climate fiction as well as solar punk specifically, but climate fiction more generally mm-hmm. and, and various aspects of it. And then that'll be capped off with a utopia awards ceremony to, to sort of just recognize authors who are writing hopeful utopian stories. We've got uh, a, actually a lunar punk book, an anthology that pre-order starts for also in October. And yeah, those are kind of the big things that are happening in the near future. That's a lot of stuff. I know. I, my brain hurts. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I like to hear that. Yeah, I know. It keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> Is there anything I neglected to ask you after all this? I think we had a good talk. It might have, I don't, I don't know if the pacing was top tier, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was good. Intriguing stuff. No, yeah, I I can't think of anything, no. Um, I mean, we covered a lot. Maybe we'll circle back um, with you again in the future. Sure. And yeah. I'm definitely going to check out more. I wonder if Lunar Punk's more my jam. I'll have to check. Maybe, yeah. And little- that's brand. That's... That's really new. Like, I mean, you if you Google it, you'll find things. Um, I did. And I think but, I just found something you wrote. I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote mm-hmm. I took a stab at like, actually, I mean, I didn't so much try to define it as much as I did sort of like pull together and give due credit to like a few other resources, places that are, are, are trying to sort of define the genre. But I'm pretty sure that... This the issue that we that Solar Punk magazine has coming out in November, and this anthology that we're publishing in January. I'm pretty sure those are the first collections of stories that like purposefully label themselves Lunar Punk. Okay. Um, I don't know that there are really any other stories out there that have purposefully called themselves that. I'm sure there's mm-hmm. stuff that that we could find that we could say, oh wow, that's Lunar Punk as fuck. But the author didn't like have 
lunar punk in mind when they were writing it necessarily. Mm -hmm. So other than like people describing what lunar punk is, there's not a lot out there. And, but, but then there is art. There's some like cool aesthetic stuff, but yeah, there's not a, not a lot in terms of stories yet. So hopefully that will change once, uh, once this stuff comes out, hopefully it'll inspire people. All right. So where on the lovely internet can people find you and um, all, I mean, all the works you just mentioned. Sure. There, I mean, there's, I guess there's a few places. I mean, so solarpunkmagazine.com is the, the primary spot where you'll find all of the solar punk related stuff that we've been talking about. And then Android Press also uh, has a, a website uh, called that is android-press.com. And not, not everything, not all the books that get published by Android Press are solar punk, but that, but there will, there's, there's only a couple books so far anyways, because we're new, but a number of them will be solar punk starting in the spring of 2023. I, and then my personal, I have a personal like writer's website too, that's just Justine Norton Kurtz and Doc. All right, good. Uh, and that has some solar punk stuff on it too. You can tout your, you know, your Twitter, your whatever you want, like Free promotion. Oh, all of that. Wow. <laughs> I'm not, you don't have my, to. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, what is it? Uh, Jank, J-A-N-K, writes. That's my uh, my Twitter handle. Uh, and it's, I think, my Instagram handle too, but I'm not on Instagram a whole lot. Yeah. I'm on Twitter enough, too much probably, but. Same. <laughs> yeah. And then I have a, what's that thing called? I have a TikTok too, but I can't remember. It might be, it might also be Jank Writes. I can't remember, but I'm not worried about it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if people care about TikTok, they'll find me. Uh, I haven't yet delved into it. Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of like hashtag solar punk stuff. So if, if people like TikTok and you'd search the solar punk hashtag, you'll probably come across something that I've done. And Solar Punk Magazine has a, a, a TikTok too. We don't use it a whole lot, but, um, and that's just probably Solar Punk Magazine is the username there. All right. Yeah. Um, as always, people can follow me if they want to, L-U-C-Y-S-T-A-G at Twitter. Um, you know how Twitter works. But definitely Non-Servium Media Collective, this thing you're listening to right now, um, and that's just at Non-Servium Media, one word. Justine, this was a very fun talk. I'm feeling very sci-fi, very optimistic, feeling good. So I appreciate you yeah. joining us and rescheduling when my power went out that time. Oh, yeah. No problem. I, I totally understand. And yeah, I had a great time, too. This was fun. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Thanks. Yep. You're listening to the Non-Servium Podcast you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. <laughs>